welcome to the Health Summit. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Roxana Fiaz, the Mayor of Newham. I'm going to make a few points on behalf of our organising group. Then we're going to have a first session on the impact on health, air pollution and transport of the Silvertown Tunnel project, should it go ahead. Then we're going to have a very short break. And then we're going to have a second session about how to stop the tunnel, how to influence policy. Uh, that's up us two. And we'll be all finished at 3.30 and the sun will still be shining and uh, get out there and get a bit of sun. Right. Uh, Roxana Fias, the mayor of Newham. And uh, as I said, could you uh, stand, on the, stand on the white piece of paper? Uh, that works brilliantly. Thanks, sir. Roxana. Thank you very much, Simon. And um, welcome, everyone. I think this is one of the most important uh, conversations, campaign moments for the residents and communities of Newham and Greenwich, and also across the entirety of East London and our capital. As you know, since 2018 at Newham Council, we have taken a very firm stance under my administration to oppose the Silver Town Tunnel. And we remain absolutely, resolutely committed to opposing its construction, notwithstanding the fact that it's been constructed. And we pledged, uh, as I put myself forward again in May, that we will continue to campaign against the Silvertown Tunnel for its adverse impact on air quality and the extra traffic it will bring to Newham. It builds on the previous campaigning that we've been doing over the preceding four years an opposition against the tunnel. And I must commend the work, the absolutely fantastic work of the coalition, Stop the Silver Town uh, Tunnel Coalition, led by Simon and Victoria and all the team for bringing together the expert knowledge, the insights for maintaining momentum against the face of adversity, for ensuring that this no longer remains a fringe political issue, but is absolutely at the centrality of our political dis discourse as we participate in the vision that we want for our capital, which absolutely has to be fairer, absolutely has to be equitable, absolutely has to be predicated on social justice, but more importantly and more profoundly, it absolutely has to respond to the devastating impact of climate emergency and the health inequality that this tunnel and other schemes that lead to some of the most toxic <laughs> pollutants in our air that are killing Londoners and killing our children. We are making a stand and it will be negligent for us to be silent and to stay silent on this very vital issue. The impact of the Silvertown Tunnel is something that deeply and profoundly concerns us here in Newham, not least because of the associated impact it will have on all those variety of measures that we're taking in response to the climate emergency. And last night we published at the council our uh, climate emergency annual report covering our progress and our achievements over the last year. We have also set out key things that we're going to be doing in the coming year, including our ongoing campaigning work against the Silvertown Tunnel as part of our absolute commitment to the health and well-being of our residents. The health and well-being is a central feature of what my administration is about, not least because of the health inequality that disproportionately impacts communities of colour here in Newham. Across Newham, we have several neighbourhoods uh, that exceed the World Health Organization limits of particulates that cause the damage to our health and the corresponding impact that that has on the NHS. We have a situation where some 115 people die prematurely, largely attributable to the emissions from vehicles. And we also have a devastating situation where four and a half thousand children are sent to hospital because of severe respiratory conditions. And the centrality of our work in this area in opposition to the Silvertown Tunnel 
is central to our mission of building a fairer Newham, one which is, yes, greener, one which is, yes, healthier, and one which is absolutely about advancing and progressing on our agenda around social and economic and racial justice. And we already in the council have ensured the, the way in which we spend every single penny and pound at the council uh, needs to be measured towards how it contributes to the health and well-being of our residents. And by the end of the first year of my second term, we will be presenting to council our first ever green budget. And the green budget basically marshals the entirety of the 1.5 billion pounds that the council spends across all of the service areas in ensuring that it's meeting our carbon neutral and carbon zero targets. Our carbon zero target in, New in Newham is achieving carbon zero by 2045. So as we go forward in 2022, we'll be stepping up our campaigning across a number of areas as it pertains to the Silvertown Tunnel and in opposition and ongoing opposition to the tunnel, both during the construction phase, which is presently underway, and opposing the threat of traffic increase in the future, and taking sure, making sure that all the steps that we need to put in place in the council, in our engagement with residents, is transparent as part of our commitment to enhancing accountability, and making sure that we add our voice, our strong voice, to our representations, not just to the Mayor of London, but to the Secretary of State and also to the TfL Commissioner. So what do some of these actions actually look like? So number one, it's about ensuring, notwithstanding our opposition to the tunnel, we want it to stop. The construction is underway. We've got to work through all of the instruments at our disposal, policy, legal instruments to get it to stop but whilst we're doing that it's about ensuring that we're pressing the mayor of london in relation to air quality monitoring in our side of the silvertown tunnel both in terms of the numbers of monitors what they are measuring and where they are placed it's really disappointing and totally unacceptable to our residents and to the council that we are still waiting for a response to a follow-up letter that I sent to the Mayor of London last year. And in the entirety of our campaign over the four year period between 2018, there were a number of communications that I had sent personally to the Mayor of London. At a time where there is heightened awareness about the risk to both health and climate of the increase in traffic and the pollution as a result of construction affecting local, local air quality, there should be no need for defensiveness on this issue. The key fault line as being presented to us by TfL is that the development control order and the application that was submitted and subsequently approved specified air quality monitoring units for a particular type of poll pollutant. It didn't mention, because at that time, the scientific evidence of the absolutely devastating impact of other types of pollutants wasn't known. We need to have the ability in the defense of the health of our residents to make adaptations. We can't have a planning system that is so rigid in its application of planning policy and the conditions that we're able to tie to planning applications that doesn't evolve or demonstrate sufficient flex when we know and when the evidence presents us with new vital human life-saving information and that's something that we're going to be lobbying on so they've said in the application that was passed that in the new context there only needs to be one air quality monitor that just monitors a limited number of the pollutants that we need to be tracking but not the wide range of pollutants contaminants in our air that really are a risk to life as evidenced by the scientific community and the World Health Organization. And the particular damaging particulate matter that we're really concerned about is the PO2.5 particulate matter, 
and that should also be measured, not just the nitrogen dioxide uh, pollutant. And we will carry on pressing for answers, carry on demanding that we have installed in the places we want, because we know that the construction, Im construction impact uh, will be uh, across a much more broader area than TfL suggests. And at the moment, they're just allowing for one air quality monitor. So we're going to carry on pressing for answers and we need the proper monitoring that was promised and uh, when the permission for the tunnel was granted, but crucially, the flex that is required. We remain committed to work with advocate and to work with an advocate on behalf of our residents and our businesses, not least over the lack of engagement in terms of their concerns about health impacts by the construction company, by TfL and by the Mayor of London. And we stand with local residents and businesses absolutely without qualification. And one of the things uh, I would like to see, and I'm pleased to be able to announce today, and I will be publishing more details at a full council meeting that's taking place on a week on Monday, that we will be setting up and establishing a working group to look at the issue of air quality monitoring as it pertains to the Silver Town Tunnel. We stand with all of our friends, colleagues, allies, regardless of which political party in the broader coalition that has been established and have been doing absolutely sterling work, who are concerned that in the future, the tolling charges on the tunnel may be scrapped because of the weaknesses inherent in the contracts and in the planning applications and documents. We're demanding that a refresh modeling that was promised of what the future air quality impacts may be is published without delay. This is really vital as part of a healthy democracy and healthy conversation about you know, what we need to be alert to and as part of rightly the accountability process. We need transparency on this. So local people, local politicians know what we are dealing with. We cannot be brushed away. We were promised a revised modelling within two years in advance of the tunnel opening. The original proposal was for the tunnel to open in 2026. So we're going to be stepping up our efforts and our campaigning around the air quality modelling uh, piece that is required. In my discussions with officers, they've been advised by TfL that the cost is huge. And one of the things that we will be exploring <coughs> are other modeling instruments, uh, working with key academics, the scientific community. What are those cheaper modeling units that we could be looking at procuring, commissioning, building in order to establish a modeling uh, regime for Newham? And I welcome any uh, interventions or any interest on part of my colleagues in the Royal Borough of Greenwich who would like to collaborate on that front. And finally, we will optimize our own role in the Silvertown Tunnel um, a body that's been established with key partners, including local authorities. And this should be an absolutely important forum where we're engaging with not only TfL, but the Mayor of London and his deputy in order to ensure that our issues, our concerns, uh, our belief that the tunnel is going to be a absolutely regressive feature in our collective ambition to improve the health, well-being and livelihoods of not only new residents, residents, not only Greenwich residents, but also all of Londoners, as we remain also committed to the absolute crucial need of modality shift towards walking, cycling, use of public transport, that is an important feature of the vision for London uh, in the coming decades. So in terms of what you will be seeing more of over the coming year and subsequent years, and in that crucial period as construction uh, continues, albeit I'm confident and I'm hopeful that we will be able to make some serious interventions in slowing it down and stopping it ultimately. We need to all rally together. We need to all come together. We need to work through all the different elements and features and the tactics of this coalition campaign, which rightly needs to include all of us, all voices, 
including more importantly, the voices of those residents of ours that live at the heart of the communities that will be impacted. Thank you very much. To uh, take part in the first panel because we're, we're a bit behind time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we're very grateful for Roxana's very uh, detailed answers there. I'm sure you've got residents here, Roxana, who will uh, be checking up on you. Uh, <laughs> and that's the point of having events like this. And so thank, thank, thanks very much. Now, I'm going to, on behalf of the coalition, just uh, try and set the scene a bit with why we think that even at this late stage, the project can and should be stopped. And also talk about some of the things that I think, well, we haven't yet stopped the tunnel, uh, we have already achieved. And then we'll move on to the first uh, session. Um, so like all road building projects, this one has to be considered in the context of transport policy as a whole. The only arguments I've heard in favor of the tunnel are that it will reduce traffic jams at the Blackwall Tunnel, as though these traffic jams can be isolated from all other problems in the world. Um, supporters of the tunnel say, what will you do about traffic jams? We say, reduce the total number of cars on the road, which actually we do need to do anyway to address the appalling levels of air pollution and the dangers of global warming. So when we say stop Silvertown Tunnel, that means we also say a transport policy that favors public transport, a, a, a transport policy that encourages people to travel by train or bus or walk, cycle or use an electric scooter. And if you read the London Mayor's transport policy of 2018, it actually looks as though this is the plan in the big headlines. But the small print and the reality is very different. The reality is that road transport in private cars is subsidized and supported and other modes are not sufficiently. That transport policy promises, in 2018, promises public transport projects such as North to South Crossrail, extension of the DLR to Thamesmead that have moved no further forward. At least we have the Crossrail East to West. And what a great thing it is, an advertisement for what public transport uh, can be. But at the same time, as we have been emerging from the pandemic, we've had the congestion charge suspended in the evening. That's a move backwards. We've had public transport fares going up. That's a move backwards. And we've had bus route, a list of bus routes uh, that are going to be cut. That's a move backwards. Now, it's not all the mayor's fault. We understand that the government has a hand in this. But the negotiations between the mayor and the government have a logic that produces more threats to public transport and but unity and support of roads and cars. Now, today's summit is focused on the air pollution and health consequences of that. Um, and the, the speakers in the first panel will deal with that. I just want to say a few words about how these issues connect with climate change and energy policy. Just as the mayor talks to talk about air pollution, so he does about climate change, but big road projects are incompatible with London's climate targets. In January, the mayor announced new targets to reach so-called net zero by 2030, and he also commissioned research into scenarios for the transport sector that would make this possible. Under the relevant scenarios, the volume of traffic would have to go down by 2030 by 27% or 40%, depending on the way that uh, the research has worked it out. Such substantial cuts in car use really could help in terms of climate change. So then the question is, if you're going to make those cuts, why on earth are you pressing ahead with a two billion pound road project uh, to make room for more cars? Because as any transport researcher will tell you, and I suspect in the first panel, somebody will, if you address the problem of traffic by building more roads, you get more traffic. And the construction industry then proposes more roads. And that's what's happening now. And if the Silvertown Tunnel is built, the next project to be considered by the government is the Lower Thames Crossing, six lanes, 22 kilometers, a motorway under the tunnel, at uh, the Thames uh, near Gravesend, 8.2 billion. Madness. Now, a point about the local and the global. The cumulative effect of road projects and other fossil fuel intensive infrastructure in the global north not only damages children's health right here in Newham, it also impacts on the lives and health of people in the global south. And we can't forget that. We can't separate these things out. And a very good explanation of this connection was given to us 
by uh, Suga Thakapurayil, the Newham councillor, in August 2020, when we demonstrated outside the Transport for London headquarters in Stratford. And councillor Suga made a brief speech there about how fossil fuel use in the global north, enhanced by projects like the Silvertown Tunnel, is already driving people from their homes in Bangladesh. And when I say driving people from their homes, in that year, 2020, two and a half million people, two and a half million, were, in, were internally displaced in Bangladesh and India, mostly temporarily. In other words, a lot of them could then return. But 2.8 million homes were damaged. And this was all as a result of Cyclone Amphan. Now, that sort of storm is made much more likely by climate change. So it's not going to be a Hollywood disaster movie tomorrow. It's the slow effect which is already happening to people in Bangladesh and India. And you can well imagine the health consequences of such a dreadful upheaval. So let's not talk about building road projects in the rich world without considering all the consequences. Now, I'm going to pick out three things that I think our campaign has achieved. First, I think we've mounted, uh, it, it's a campaign that's been going for a long time, by the way, about 10 years now. Now, first, I think we've mounted a sustained challenge to greenwash. Politicians at City Hall have gone to pretty extraordinary lengths to present the tunnel as compatible with climate policy, and we've protested vigorously. And some false claims are now the subject of a complaint to the local government ombudsman. We've also challenged greenwashing by the C40 Cities Alliance that is supported by the mayor. Now, in 2016, that alliance is a global organization of different mayors in, in large cities across the world, published a report. The report warned that new transport infrastructure could fatally ruin cities' chances of meeting climate targets. So it's not just us that's saying this. But then the alliance allowed the mayor's office to misuse its correspondence and falsely dress up a report by Arup, the engineering firm, as an independent assessment of the mayor's climate strategy. And I can see people here in this room who had the letters from Heidi Alexander telling them about the independent assessment. It was no such thing. Challenges by our campaign have made it harder for politicians to dress up climate trashing politicians as green, and that battle's not over. Second, we've challenged undemocratic attempts to prevent the tunnel project being discussed. I live in Woolwich. In Greenwich, we were told repeatedly over the last two years by senior councillors that to discuss the tunnel would be outside the council's legal and statutory powers. Clearly nonsense, and we challenged it. And thanks to our challenges, and thanks to the efforts of many friends of ours in the Labour Party and uh, within the council, we finally persuaded the council to hold the discussion they said they couldn't hold. And when they did so in March, they called on the London Mayor to pause and review the project as Newham Council had done previously. Now on Thursday, two days ago, another example, the London Assembly voted to ask the Mayor to commission a modelling exercise that would cover a scenario in which drivers using the Silvertown Tunnel don't pay tolls. Because every time we talk about the traffic, the message comes back, it's all right, there's going to be a toll that's going to keep the level of traffic down. Point one, that, doesn't, that didn't happen on the Big Dartford Crossing. Point two, there's nothing in law that prevents a future mayor coming along, appealing to the driver's lobby and uh, scrapping the toll. So that the London Assembly has now told the mayor uh, to model that one. And these are successes for our campaign, but also assertions of local democracy at a time when it's in short supply. Third, we fostered unity around an issue that could potentially be divisive. The construction industry, the driver's lobby, climate change deniers have always painted opponents of road projects as crazy extremists who want to make ordinary drivers' lives a misery. I say this as an ordinary driver, by the way. We've successfully cut through this. We've shown that ordinary families who have cars need more public transport and walking and cycling op options so they could use the cars less or not at all. And we've convinced people that there are ways to do transport policy that benefit everybody. The Silvertown Tunnel isn't one of them. And we've united in opposition to the tunnel community organizations, transport workers, teachers, other trade unions, the political parties, health practitioners, and all the researchers of climate, transport, urban development. Final for me, we've got to be honest, we may not win this fight. Our coalition said repeatedly that we'll fight to the end. The end means when that boring machine, which is now being assembled, is lowered down and starts boring the tunnel. Now, until that happens, and it hasn't happened yet, 
they first they said it was spring, then it was May or June, then it was over the summer. So it hasn't happened. Until that happens, pause and cancel is completely, uh, well, pause and review and cancel is completely realistic. Those machines, as far as I understand, can be sold off in the international market. London Assembly members in February proposed an amendment to London's budget showing how you would do that and you would still save hundreds of millions of pounds compared to going ahead. So, I mean, it can be done. If the boring machine starts work, I do think the situation changes and I get a commitment on behalf of our organizing group that if that happens, we'll hold another gathering of this kind, uh, get you out on a sunny Saturday afternoon and uh, discuss what to do next. Because if the tunnel goes ahead, we will still have to do everything we can to resist road-centered transport policy and pollution climate change. So we'll work hard to build on the challenges we presented to greenwash, the challenges to undemocratic practices and to build on the unity uh, we've achieved. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Speakers are here for the first time to come up here. We'll just need one minute if everybody online can uh, bear with us. And our first speaker online uh, is going to be John Whiteleg, and he's hopefully going to speak to us back in Zoom land. Uh, and there's John. Hello, John. So we're going with Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, John is our first speaker, and he's got slides. Okay. Shall I begin? <laughs> Well, hello everybody. Thank you. I will. I will begin. I'm sorry, I'm not with you, and I'm absolutely delighted. Stop! 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 Yeah. Hold it. Hold on. I wasn't being told to stop. Hold on. There's a technical problem. Okay. Um, can you hear me, John? I can. Fantastic. Okay. Right. Um, I'm just going to tell everybody who they're going to hear, and it's okay. uh, you first, and then we'll have um, uh, Anna Moore. Uh, welcome. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Jenny Bates, who hopefully is out there in cyberspace. And then we'll have Ian Mudway, who's also here with us. Thanks very much for uh, joining us. And uh, in, in this unique hybrid format. And uh, John, start when uh, Yara tells you to start. Okay. Okay. Hold, hold on a second. Um, you can start in five seconds from when I say go. Go. Hello, everybody. I hope I'm obeying the technological rules and regulations. I, I don't normally obey anything. Uh, I am delighted to be able to be with you this afternoon. I'm sorry I'm not there physically. It's a real privilege to be part, even a small bit part, of this wonderful campaign. Uh, what I have to say will probably be quite familiar to you all. But I, I take it far more seriously than most people take in my discussions with local authorities, with central government, uh, with in, industrial and business, business people. I think the Silvertown Tunnel is probably one of the best, which means one of the worst, examples of a dramatic public policy failure. And I think it's important to join the dots, to bring all these things together and to try and provide a clearer framework for evaluating and assessing what the Mayor of London and what TfL are doing and what all the alternatives are. And the dramatic public policy failure uh, could not be much bigger. It's a dramatic failure of public health. It's a dramatic failure of dealing with climate change. It's a dramatic failure of dealing with social justice. And all of these things pile in, really, to provide a multiplication uh, factor, which I've not come across before, even on some other major road projects. I'm holding on a short amount of time, but I'm very happy for people to come back to me and ask for clarification at any stage of the next, this today, of course, but in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, you all know the geography, but I'm a geographer by trading, so it's part of geography, uh, geography trading to, to show a map. 
Uh, the interesting thing, uh, which you know a lot more about than I do about Newham and Greenwich, is they, uh, we've got a high population, uh, a high density of population, and the demographic and the social and the income and the deprivation characteristics of these two London boroughs are at the serious end of serious, which means that uh, we have huge opportunities for correcting the things that have gone wrong historically, and that huge opportunity is being wasted on, on a very expensive tunnel that has, I, I would argue, maybe extremely perhaps, but argue has nothing at all to offer to the residents, to the 630,000 residents of Newham and Greenwich, other than we are going to make your life worse and we are not going to spend any of that money to make your life better. Next slide, please. Um, this again is well known, uh, and it's a bit cheeky of me, uh, uh, living a long way from a London borough, to talk about these things, but I do want to emphasise that if you look at the uh, social, demographic, economic uh, characteristics of these two London boroughs, we are looking at figures like in Newham, one of the 20% most deprived districts, unity authorities in England, and 20% of the children living on low income, and it's very similar in Greenwich. And, and I just want to make one point about this. It's not just a kind of a, a demographic, geographical, sort of uh, a rather boring descriptive statistic. It means that tens of thousands of people are suffering a poor quality of life. They're not being provided with the improvements to quality of life, to air quality, to public health. And they, they, they are put in a situation where the status quo of deprivation and poor quality living uh, conditions are, are being emphasized by, by high spending alternatives, uh, we, which we could use that money to make things better. And when we talk about low income, by the way, we're talking in, in England and in London boroughs particularly about a, a globally significant higher probability of death and injury on roads, which is directly correlated with low income. We're talking about a much higher level of noise, which is directly correlated with so-called cognitive difficulty. Basically, children in schools of school age suffer disproportionately from noise in, in their living and working in, in their living and school environments. And that is something that is unacceptable. So it's another layer of unacceptability. Next slide, please. Again, I guess uh, many people um, in, in the meeting, in, in this discussion this afternoon, are very familiar with these things. But I, I am increasingly um, astonished, amazed, appalled by the lack of intelligent thinking, the lack of joined up thinking uh, that takes place. It's a general thing in, in Britain, but it's particularly worrying in London where the mayor of London uh, makes all sorts of um, uh, very attractive uh, greenwash statements about climate change and, and, and adding to the quality of life of residents. But there, there is no sign of intelligent thinking. Uh, intelligent thinking means linking specific things that improve public health, dealing with huge health inequalities. We still in Britain, after 20, 30 years of research, haven't got to the bottom of explaining and even more uh, importantly, correcting why relatively poor people suffer poor health uh, and much poorer health than relatively rich people. And increasingly, it is alarming that politicians speak about zero carbon and then carry on doing things like our 34 billion road building program in England, like the Silvertown Tunnel and like many other things. And the good news, which doesn't exist in London, I'm very sorry to say, is the Welsh government's attitude, uh, mainly because they have something called the Commission for Future Generations. And I was very fortunate to take part in a public inquiry into the M4 relief road in South Wales, which involved a big tunnel, by the way, and all that evidence and all that research and the, and the input of the Commission for Future Generations led to the cancellation. And this is what we're asking for in the Silvertown Tunnel case. We need, we must have cancellation. Next slide, please. This is a big subject, so do forgive me for the incredibly abbreviated um, point. Um, there is a lot of science around the kind of things I'm talking about and the kind of things that all of you in this campaign are talking about. Uh, it is nonsense to suggest that building a tunnel, uh, proceeding with a Silvertown tunnel, will in any way at all ever 
uh, produce anything to solve congestion anywhere on any other tunnel, any other road link. We have the best research in the world in Britain on the, the, the subject known as induced traffic. New high, new road building, new highways, new tunnels, new bridges generates new traffic. And that dreadful acronym SACTRA, the Standing Advisory Committee on Trunk Road Assessment, is, what, is one of the global high points of high quality transport research and of course totally ignored by central and local government in England. Congestion cannot be reduced by adding extra highway capacity. There's a whole theoretical subject about uh, discussion ar around this topic. It's induced traffic. It's the fact that traffic behaves like a gas and not a liquid and it expands to fill the available space. It, it, it is nonsense and insulting to suggest that when there's a congestion problem, we could in any way solve it by building extra highway capacity. Additional highway capacity, roads, bridges, tunnels and so on, from an economic point of view, is also a failure. Another SACTRA, Standing Advisory Committee on Trunk Road Assessment, report. New roads, new bridges, new tunnels can just as easily drain jobs away from the local economy. There is no direct, robust uh, evidence base to show that donating a large new road or a bridge or a tunnel to a local economy produces any local economic benefits. Additional highway capacity, and we've got so many studies of this, it becomes quite tedious, has never reduced poverty, never reduced deprivation, never reduced disadvantageness, and never improved the quality of life of the conditions of low income groups. And we do know additional highway capacity increases air pollution and carbon. And both of those are unacceptable unless we think we're not really interested in, in uh, climate change and carbon, and unless we think our, our annual, our England death rate from air pollution, we only kill 40,000 people a year from air pollution, the majority of which is from traffic, and um, if we don't think that's important, then of course we can build lots of tunnels and lots of bridges and lots of roads. Additional highway capacity increases air pollution and deaths in, in, in uh, poor, poor environmental conditions. Next slide, please. So uh, there's an even more tedious and slightly boring subject area called WebTag, Web-Based Transport Appraisal Guidance. So again, Britain is well famous for its excellent transport policy uh, in Web-Based Transport Appraisal Guidance. And it's so excellent, it, 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 I, I've been involved in over 20 public inquiries into road proposals, including the Thames Gateway Bridge some years ago, and nobody ever takes any notice of WebTag. So Britain really is uh, uh, an outstanding example of excellent thinking and policy that is ignored by everybody and never put into practice. WebTag says, what's the problem? Uh, uh, how many things exist? to help us to solve that problem? What are the options? Um, how do we then actually evaluate all those options and choose the, um, and, and have a methodology that's very clear to help us choose the best one, and then we choose the best one. Now, it depends really, if, if, if the objective of Silvertown Tunnel is to reduce congestion, it's failed at base one. If, it, if the objective is to improve air quality, quality it never stood a chance. If the objective is to improve road safety, never stood a chance. If the objective is to improve social justice, never stood a chance. So why on earth are people uh, pursuing such a project when it cannot deliver established policy, web-based transport appraisal guidance, and when it makes so many public policy, high level object objectives unlikely to be achieved and more likely to be worsened. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the good news, and I'd hate you to go away thinking that I'm just a miserable what's it delivering lots of bad news. The good news is that uh, not only in Britain, but around the world, we have some excellent examples of excellent transport policy, usually rooted in what the community wishes and what the community wants and what the community has uh, voiced uh, as, as a request. I've just come out of uh, uh, an exciting project in the county of Herefordshire called the Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change. And it was a pleasure to be part of that uh, project. And the citizens uh, all took part in, in uh, designing what they wanted out of a transport system. No road building, no increases in highway capacity, excellent walking and cycling, and excellent public transport. And the people have spoken, science has spoken, that's what is wanted, that's what is needed, and that's what the majority of local authorities and Transport for London and the Mayor of London and central government do not want. Okay, we can have car-free streets and car-free areas. We can have buses that match international best practice. 
uh, I work a lot in Germany and uh, uh, go, going like wildfire in Germany at the moment is a new, a new plan, which is one euro per day uh, for the full use of the public transport system in any German city. We can have best practice, high quality, traffic free bike paths that connect residential areas with schools, colleges, NHS sites, jobs, social cultural opportunities. Uh, there's a whole range of fiscal interventions if we really do want to reduce congestion and I actually suspect whether that, well I not suspect, I know that's not a real objective, it's just an excuse for building roads and tunnels. If we really do want to reduce congestion, I can do it starting next Monday. Uh, dynamic road pricing, workplace parking levies, levies uh, residential travel plans, school travel plans, uh, the whole gamut of so-called demand management and fiscal intervention actually works. Uh, Oxfordshire County Council has a plan to reduce traffic levels by 25%. And a lot of this applies to freight transport as well, to shift uh, heavy goods vehicle movements to rail and river alternatives. So we're, we're dealing with a particularly serious and quite a tragic situation. We have huge numbers of opportunities to do the right thing they all cost a lot less than doing the wrong thing and doing the right thing is rejected by politicians next slide please so what next um i think you know what next you know better than i do uh, it's rather obvious we must cancel all tunnel bridge and road building and quote strong evidence-based reasons for doing so and actually have the courage and the guts and the ethical uh, imperative to do it properly and explain why we must acknowledge that after two or three decades of discussion in Britain, we're not improving social problems and health problems, and they're never improved by concrete and tarmac and tunnels and bridges. And we must adopt a totally integrated traffic reduction plan. We must reduce traffic, by the way, uh, not build extra highway capacity. We must reduce traffic by, and, and there are estimates around about the 25%, 35%, 40%. We must reduce traffic levels linked to strong public health policies and a plan that improves quality of life. The main thing that matters in the Silvertown Tunnel discussion from my external, rather remote perspective, is I want to improve the lives of 636,000 people. I want to improve the lives of people suffering poor health. I want to reduce road traffic accidents and danger. I want better public health through more walking and cycling, better social and economic opportunities through better public transport. And I don't want a tunnel because that will make everything worse. Next slide, please. Have I been disconnected for bad behavior? No, sorry, the slide isn't loading for some reason. One no, that, that's because we're finished. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. If I can answer any questions, I will. And I'm always very happy to answer uh, questions that are submit, submitted after a day like today by email or through the organizers. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sean. Sean. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I think I'm speaking for everybody when I say thank you very much. And to apologise for not having said before that John is a professor of sustainable transport at uh, Liverpool John Moores University. But I mean, you've heard during his talk that the, the number of inquiries have been involved in uh, the expertise uh, that he uh, has. And uh, if you have questions for him, hold them, please. We're going to try and uh, go through our other speakers here on the panel. The next one is here in person. Um, Anna, I'm going to ask you to come and stand on this magic uh, square when I get off it. Um, and Anna is a respiratory registrar and education fellow at Bart's Health uh, and 2021 to 2 Health Education England uh, Population Health Fellow. So we're really, really pleased, and a local resident. Uh, I, so we're really, really pleased to have Anna with us. Um, Anna, and I, I just, this isn't you, this is all speakers. If you can keep to eight minutes, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. I'm 
slightly sad to be speaking before Ian so I was hoping to absorb a little bit of kind of wisdom and knowledge from him but um, I, I'm a respiratory doctor and I work um, at Bart's Health. I, I work in a clinic um, just in fact one clinic every other week which just looks at breathlessness so we have patients who come who are breathless for any reason and we focus on that um, and a lot of the people that I see have got asthma, COPD um, and lots of other reasons and in fact lots of other cr chronic long-term conditions and Actually, it's something that as medical students, we don't learn an awful lot about. I've got a colleague here, Sharon, who will back me up here. But medical students and doctors, we, do, we don't get very much training in it. And it's had to be something that I think we've developed kind of ourselves, our thinking on this. And so in recent time, I've started just asking about it. I've started asking people where they live. And goodness, you just get the answers that you expect, which is I live right next to a main road. Um, and I'm thinking of one patient that I saw in particular who I met last year who has really, really nasty asthma, really serious breathlessness associated with that and really kind of chronic nasal sinus um, congestion problems. And honestly, I've done quite a lot of thinking and kind of developing learning in the last year. And last year when I met her, I thought, I don't know, don't know what's going on with this asthma. We need to get on top of it, talking to her about you know, uh, controlling it with steroids and like, making sure she's using her inhalers right. And uh, so I had that conversation. She came back six months later and nothing had improved. Nothing had changed. She was still having her chest infections, you know, every month. Spunged up, absolutely awful. And um, she just dropped into the conversation. I'm just wondering if maybe anything, it's anything to do with it that I live right next to one of the air vents from the Blackboard Tunnel. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that'll be it, won't it? And that just that one, that moment, I thought, I can't do anything about this. She can't do anything about this. She's completely stuck. And I asked, what happens when you go away on holiday? She said, oh yeah, no, it really clears up. So this is where these people live and there's nothing that they can do. She's in social housing. I can write a letter to the social housing people. I can say that this lady's got terrible, terrible asthma, but what's it gonna do? We've, we've, got, no, we've got massive problems with housing as well. So I just wanted to kind of illustrate the kind of complete you know we, we are stuck as health professionals and it that might be part of why we're not taught about it because there's so little that we clinically one-on-one -on -one with this person can do but that's not the case for the whole of kind of reality because actually it's really important we talk about this um as as clinicians as health professionals that's why i'm really really delighted to have been asked here today and to see um, see sharon as well and and in um so it's, it's really fantastic that we are we, we now there does seem to be a kind of we're, we're we're kind of getting a voice for this and I think we need to make every single you know as, as much as we possibly can of this this is this is one of the biggest health issues of our time of course the biggest health issue is climate change and they're very very closely linked that with air pollution um, and it was something that um that John was just talking about I was going to move on a little, little bit to kind of the injustice of this so so air pollution causes one in 16 deaths in the UK but of course that's not all but it's not the set that's that's across the UK and I'm just thinking how many people how many deaths of the people in Newham um in Tower Hamlets in North Greenwich is it actually causing and I suspect that number would be a bit higher if we go to those areas where there's more pollution certainly we know that air pollution maps very closely to deprivation so we know that in more deprived areas it's much like more likely to be um li living in areas of high pollution but that of course also means that people who live in those areas are already vulnerable to long-term health uh, conditions which air pollution only worsens so we're in this kind of awful vicious cycle um so that, that i wanted to reflect on on what john was talking about if you if you build roads you get gray you get concrete you get tarmac and that again is another health individual and and um what's the word for it um uh it, it's in itself a health risk not having access to green space but it also exacerbates the effects of climate change. So if we're in in, green, in tarmac, concrete urban areas, those, those become our urban heat islands um, where people who are already vulnerable because of their health, long-term health conditions caused by deprivation, long-term health conditions caused by air pollution will then be more vulnerable to the effects of climate change and heat waves. They, they just can't get away. So we're just creating, we're just building in more and more health problems, which we cannot get away from. There is nothing I can do as a doctor to make the, the, this people's lives better. I'm completely powerless, um, except for being able to talk about it. Um, so yeah, I just also, I was trying to remember the number. I'm, I'm not great at numbers as a doctor. I probably shouldn't um, uh, confess that. But, but the number that sticks in my mind is that each car in London costs the health service £8,000 a year. 
so and I was just cycling uh, with my daughter today so I was just thinking there's a car there's a car there's a car there's a car and there's a car in the way of me being able to cycle because they're parked there there's cars kind of t- like zipping past me trying to because they have to get there first because that's very important to get past the traffic island before me on a bike um and and I think you know we we are slaves to this kind of strange overlord uh, cars which you know it which we well, are now that building more tunnels in order to allow more cars in. So I think being aware of the of the just the serious health costs that just cars just on their own cause, let alone a tunnel. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the inequalities issue is massive. We, we see that, in, that health injustice, health inequality is widening um, in the last 10 years. It's not getting any better. We're not managing to act on that. Um, and again, that's something that as, as health professionals, it's just incredibly frustrating to watch, to see, to have to, to deal with. Um, just to move on to, like, as John said, positive on this, um, the people that I see in clinic, I, you know, I talk to them about air pollution. And I, and I signpost into this fantastic resource, which is um, the Global Action Plan's health, uh, it's called Clean Air Hub. And I ask people to look at that. It's limited because it talks about air pollution indoors and air pollution outdoors. And guess what? The thing you can do is keep away from the roads. Just step back from the roads. That's the best thing to do. But one of the most powerful things I think we can do as health professionals and, and as, as people that we can talk about is, is to talk about not being in our cars. Um, and it's come to a surprise to quite a lot of my patients that the air pollution you're exposed to in the car is often higher than the air pollution outside the car. People believe the opposite. Um, and so there is a, you know, there's a, there's a chance here to just flip this, this message. People who have long term health conditions think they are dependent on cars because we need to get cars, you know, to, to the hospital or, or to around because they're, because they're disabled. But it's, it, we have to understand that the cars potentially, in a lot of cases, have put people in that position of disability. They, they cause long term health conditions. If you think about related to uh, physical inactivity, the, the number of deaths in the UK is one in six. Um, is caused by physical inactivity and that's generated by cars you know we stick sit in our cars in our car dependent society not for all people because for the, the, the most deprived people they don't have cars but <laughs> for the but last you know lots and like big majority of other people brilliant um thank you <laughs> um and and so the the kind of co-benefits of reducing cars is is massive if we can get people out of their cars if we can get people moving their bodies they're not only being more physically active which which reduces apparently a cycle commute reduces your risk of cancer by 45 percent and cardiovascular disease and the and the the physical the, the risks are outweighed by 20 to 1 the risk, risk of the benefits so it is a really it's a no-brainer to me but it also means that we're exposed to less pollution and we're also generating less uh, less pollution so if i were to if i were the mayor <laughs> i might suggest that possibly the money that we're going to be putting into the silver town tunnel we could put into infrastructure that makes it safe for people to cycle and walk so at the moment they don't feel safe often especially with <laughs> And it would mean that I saw a lot less people in clinic. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, now we're again going to see if we can uh, supersede the technical challenge and get uh, Jenny Bates, who is somewhere out there in cyberspace. Ah, oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, Jenny. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear I'm, me? I, I'm, I'm going to be very, uh, a very bossy chairman, ask you yeah. to uh, stick to eight minutes and I'll uh, let you know uh, with Yara when there's Check one minute off. left. We've got a, we've got a sign. Uh, I, that, that's just so that we can all okay. stick to our time. Now, Jenny is uh, with Friends of the Earth. She is a long, long term uh, campaigner, not only, not only about the Silver Town Tunnel, but about many other issues with regard to roads and transport so and and she was doing this um, for years before certainly years before me uh, campaigning about this tunnel so we're really pleased to have her uh, with us jenny thanks well it's my privilege to be here with all of you who care so much about this and and esteemed academics on the panel too um so yes i i i'm actually in wales now but i uh i i came to live in greenwich from 1993 
joining our Friends of the Earth voluntary group there, just as we were celebrating winning the East London River Crossing um, campaign, which is the Oxley's Wood campaign, an ancient wood. Um, and we thought that was it. That was actually a Tory government who got rid of that. Um, but of course, that isn't the end of it. And there was a consultation um, in the 90s about different options for river crossings east of Tower Bridge. And guess what? The, the, the option that was um, all road, which is basically Silvertown, was the least popular. Um, the, there was mixed interest in the one that was mixed road and public transport. And there was most, most support for the one that was all public transport. But of course, what do they do? They pursue all of them. Um, Ken, Ken Livingston as mayor, he pursued the Thames Gateway Bridge, which ended up being a six lane proposal, um, just not going through Oxley's Wood, but all the traffic would have had to fan around local streets. Um, and he had Silvertown as number two, and that got reversed later. Um, but uh, with the help of John Whiteleg, we actually helped defeat um, the, 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 the Thames Gateway Bridge, also with some uh, a deal that the Green Party made in the London Assembly with Ken to get some money to, to be able to pay people like John. Um, so, and the inspector then, he said on air pollution, he said it was unacceptable for um, air pollution that would already be bad to be further worsened. He was not happy with that. That was one of the things he said that came out uh, him coming out against the scheme. But of course, the government thought they could just reopen the inquiry and, and sort of do a little bit more fiddling. But um, in, in, in fact, uh, to give uh, un unexpected credit, Boris actually scrapped that scheme because all those roads that were going to get the, the traffic, they were all going to, they were, that was Bexley Council and, and a lot of Tory voters. Um, but sadly, then, of course, um, we then had uh, the, the Silvertown. He then he pursued Silvertown as number one and he had the other other river crossings possibly as a as, as sort of backup. Um, and then then what happened is um, ahead of the 2016 um, elections, just before Sadiq got in, we, we got him to commit to a review of, of, um, of the river crossings. And this is when the Silvertown project was turned into something supposedly not due to increase traffic or air pollution or carbon emissions overall and other crossings were sort of, uh, made to be public transport which is obviously the right thing so that's that's a sort of a little bit of history there um and so the, the result is now that even even however if you take transport for london at what they say which is no overall traffic and, and air pollution increase there are some people who would when the, the scheme is due to open would have air pollution above legal limits um, for this toxic gas nitrogen dioxide made even worse so already bad already illegal made even worse as far as i'm concerned that is unacceptable but the problem is that the and, and i said this to the inquiry on silvertown but there's some dodgy guidance which allows that and i haven't got time to go into the detail of that but suffice to say that that guidance is not fit for purpose it went back to 2014 it's um it's now being reviewed and it, it we just shouldn't be doing that sort of thing and all of this even then was about the legal limit of nitrogen dioxide at a level of 40 micrograms per meter cubed um and that was at the time what the world health organization was saying but they've now dropped their recommendation from 40 down to 10 they've cut it in a quarter of what they, they, you know, because more and more health evidence is coming out about the toxic effects. So, and then the other, so even if, on what they say, the scheme should be unacceptable, but actually there would be more traffic than tra Transport for London say, because they're not including um, what you call land use change. So at the moment, you know, because Silvertown would allow full height vehicles, extra, a lot of extra lorries want to, you know, would want to go through Silvertown. So there's huge lorry parks proposed um, around Silvertown, literally off the back of, of Silvertown happening. And so, you know, they would generate extra trips, which would result in more traffic, or the tolls would have to go up to 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 sort of control that in theory um which would affect local people and other people trying to, to to use it so that would be a problem and transport for london have even admitted in in a meeting that i had that that um this problem would actually you know if you got more traffic it would start to push the next stage of of of, of the problem um so the traffic would get across the river quicker but it would get caught up it's just get caught up at the next problems the next roundabout where where there was a sort of pinch point and if you then expanded that roundabout you then make that easier and then overall you just get more and more traffic so then silvertown would have actually increased 
traffic. Um, so they, you know, they admit that, and that's that's if we've got tolls. And as as you've heard from Simon, um, you know, there's been a legal opinion to say that you know that's not um, not not cast iron at all. And of course, if 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 that was the case, it'd be even far worse. So you know, the, there's levels of problems here. And and yet, as as Simon also mentioned, this the mayor is actually looking at doing the right thing in terms of road traffic reduction, cutting car use, cutting traffic use by, you know, at least 27% by 2030. And that's the sort of level we need nationally. There's a consensus among research that it's at least that level we need. And that's the right thing. And looking at pay-as-you-go driving for the whole of London, it's been in the transport strategy for ages um, and uh, it, it, he's looking at it more seriously. Um, and this should be an absolutely clear-cut reason to, to, to review and pause um, the scheme and, and, and scrap it. It just, you know, even less reason than there ever was, which there wasn't, uh, for doing this scheme. Um, and, and things have moved on on air, on air pollution and, and the, the evidence, as I've said. So, and there's nothing to stop um, more things being done right now to help what is a, a problem with backup and congestion um, at, the, at the existing Blackwall Tunnel. They could change the layout. It goes from three lanes into two. You, you could have bus priority, which they haven't got. You could put many more single decker buses on there. Of course, they say they want to do double deckers, but you know, if you had to do single deckers and had a hub at either end of the tunnel or in, um, you know, Canning Town or, or Woolwich or something, you know, they, those things are possible. Transport for London have never, ever looked at a full package of alternatives. They've never said, what if we can do this plus this plus that plus that? And actually, that would solve it. Um, you know, it would probably need London-wide pay-as-you-go driving. It would need traffic reduction on a wider scale and lots more investment in the good stuff. But, you know, these things are possible and they've never looked at that. Um, so, you know, effectively, he must uh, pause and scrap, etc. Ah, one minute, and I'm just coming to an end. I've probably missed out some key bits, but I can go back to them in questions. Um, one plea to people, um, which may maybe can be brought back again later in, in your session, um, about things to do is there is a consultation going on at the moment. Uh, uh, the, the government's got a, something called the Environment Act, and it is currently setting targets for these most dangerous particle uh, matter PM 2.5s. Um, and the consultation is out only till the 27th of June. And uh, I'll put it in the chat, but uh, for instance, we've got a tool to help people respond to that because the government is saying they're only going to meet a level of 10 micrograms by 2040, when we say that must be at least um, met by 2030, um, partly because that 10 level for, for particulate 2.5s is the old World Health Organization recommendation, and their new recommendation is five. So 10 must be by 2030 on the way to meeting the five level as soon as possible. So all of that is made easy in a tool. Um, if anybody can help, um, help, you know, really helps to have people push for that because that would help the Silver Town as well. If we have to cut, if we get a decent target for particulates, that will help, um, that will help control the traffic and, and push, push for least, least bad things happening. So that's a, a brief run through. Um, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, John. Okay, thanks, uh, Jenny. Um, and now uh, our last speaker in this session uh, is Ian. We'll, when Ian has uh, given his opening, we'll then have time for some uh, questions. I want to try and keep it all tight. Uh, I don't want the uh, whole thing to overrun, but please think of your questions and uh, we'll take some questions as soon as Ian uh, has spoken. And also, Yara, if you could communicate to uh, the people online uh, if they've got any questions, um, we'll take them uh, straight away. Okay, so Ian uh, is an air pollution scientist from Imperial College London. Again, he's been doing this a long time and he's got a huge list of qualifications that I'm not gonna read out. Uh, he, he's also uh, connected there with the School of Public Health. Uh, Ian, welcome. It's mud way, as in mud, mud yeah. is to believe, followed by way. Okay. 
I come from the countryside, can you tell? <laughs> Do you take one step forward? One step forward. That's perfect. Got to, got to stand on the X. Um, you know, I thought about what I was going to talk about today, but then you're last. You get to hear Puddy House say things, and you're sitting there going, I, I really need to cover a few things. And actually, it's much more important we hear your questions and that we get an opportunity to answer them. So I'm going to keep my talk, actually, extremely brief. You don't even have to look at the timer. Um, because what I want to point out to you is that the air quality in, in London, as it is today, is causing people to die earlier than they should of respiratory and cardiovascular disease. It's also causing increased rates of dementia. It's affecting individuals on a daily basis who have in youth asthma or in age COPD. And it's affecting the development of our children in our city today at the levels it exists at at this present moment in time, which means that we are causing harm now, which will affect the health of our children as they age of the next 10, 20 or 30 years. And so against that background, there is both an urgency to improve air quality, because otherwise you're guilty of the good you did not do. But equally, any step you take, which is regressive or an outlayer, kind of undermines the messaging which is necessary to bring the public with you on that journey. Anything which induces traffic is a problem. So you could argue we have the ULES. I'm a huge fan of the ULES. It's been very effective. I know people have all sorts of views about it, but it has had an impact on emissions. They have gone down. But it is wrong to see that as creating headspace, which you can fill back up with emissions because you can build or you can develop. And we have a huge problem, not just within London, but within the United Kingdom, between understanding the relative balance of public health versus, if you like, debates about housing or infrastructure projects. For example, if I was to reduce air pollution in London by 5%, but then build cheap affordable housing next to the busiest roads in London, I might be able to say air pollution has gone down, but I would actually have been increasing the exposures to the most vulnerable members of our community. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is that science isn't static. There was a statement which was made in Roxana's uh, statement to begin with, and you may not have heard it because I was standing at the back, my jaw dropped. Not because I disagreed with what, her, what she said, but she said, people had said that PM 2.5 wasn't such an important thing to be concerned with. Um, PM 2.5 has the largest evidence base in terms of causing ill health of any of the known pollutants. The reason it hasn't been a focus of debate within the United Kingdom is because of where the legal limit was set by the European Union, which was 25 micrograms per meter cubed. So if you looked at the map of London and you coloured it in, like we often do, to say where is exceeding the guideline, it always looks as though PM 2.5 wasn't a problem. But the limit, the guideline value from the WHO, which is set based on health evidence, was always 10. So the EU level was already sort of like 2.5 times over that. And it has just fallen, been reduced to five, not because these numbers are plucked out of the air by a, science, you know, a group of scientists. These are very careful negotiations, synthesis of evidence. They have been reduced because there is evidence of ill health effects at concentrations beneath those previous levels. So as Jenny said, nitrogen dioxide, where the focus has been, has gone from 40 to 10, and PM 2.5 has gone from 10 to five. That means this scheme now has to be evaluated, not against old standards, but against new standards. If you thought there was headspace because NO2 emissions had gone down, they're now, even in the best case scenario, way over the new guideline values. That has to be factored into our discussion. I think that's incredibly important. The other thing I was also keen to point out is not only is, does this cause public health concerns, not only is there, are there social justice issues, this is also fiscally unsound, both within London and nationally. Yes, I love the statistic. I, I, I want that statistic, 8,000 pounds worth of you know, 
costs to the NHS. But even the Treasury's own valuation of the impact of air pollution is 13 billion. The Royal College of Physicians estimated that up to 20 billion per annum, yes, as a cost which falls through premature death and, and sort of inactivity and inability to work because of poor health. So actually, we don't, you know, spend enough time making that cost argument. If somebody says we built this, it will bring this much work, this much value to the economy, that should be titrated actively against the known and robust house statistics about what these policy infrastructure housing do in terms of having a failure to do so is a failure of governance on an astronomical scale. Now that's all I'm going to say, and the rest of you can then answer the question.